You primitives think you own the stars, but you have no conception of what you are saying. You can barely command your own lumpen bodies, so how do you believe that you can subjugate entire worlds? Attributed to Prince Moravel of the White Flame Corsairs, in response to an order to surrender to Imperial forces at the Battle of Lathor. Hello, and welcome to Lost Transmissions. Yet another episode of a Battlefleet Gothic podcast set in the Age of Darkness. I'm your host, Stephen, here as always with our co-host, Austin. And um, we're going a little bit off the rails today. We're going to talk about uh, some things that don't necessarily... I guess they don't have anything necessarily to do with rules as far as our red books go. Um, but they are some topics that have been brought up to us a few times. A couple people have had questions. We've watched y'all in the Discord bat these questions back and forth um, while we look on uncaring as cold, well, sullen gods. Steven looks on. I don't see the Discord that often. No. Oh, well, yes. Um, and if our little opening quote there was anything to go by, we're going to start off with Eldar. Now, I know that all of you fine, fine crusade commanders do not play Eldar. Uh, chances are you are remaining pure to the divinity of the human form and uh, snubbing all things alien. However, it is our experience that in any given Battlefleet Gothic community, there is always at least one Eldar player, aspiring or otherwise, and there's always at least one Orc player. Now, we know that before the heresy, and potentially even during, although such instances are few and far between, um, the Crusade forces did obviously fight with alien forces. Um, and even though they exterminated most of them, courtesy of an Imperial Homeowners Association, um, Eldar and Orcs were definitely among them, and still persist to this day. So if you are feeling a little bit froggy, and you want to... Um, play your fancy Crusade fleet, or Mechanicum fleet, or Rogue Trader fleet. Um, do something a little more narrative with it, and play against Eldar or Orcs. Well, this is the episode for you. We're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to play against Xenos, what you can expect. Um, we have a little bit of experience playing against them, I anyway. Austin probably has buckets and buckets and buckets of experience playing against I, perfidious aliens. I have blown up some Xenos in my time, yes. Yes. Um, so join him as he takes it away and talks about aliens in the Age of Darkness. Yeah, so uh, we're only going to talk about, I guess you call them the big two, right? Orcs and Eldar. Uh, they were in the original blue book for Battlefleet Gothic. Other stuff exists. Uh, and, and very specifically, normal Eldar. Uh, the Eldar Corsair and Craft World lists. I'm not talking about Dark Eldar, uh, just because they're a completely different fleet uh, and pretty rare. Although, the, well, I should say the actual ships are rare because they do look like barbed flying dildos uh, and are all metal. And both being ugly as sin and being relatively hard to find metal models, uh, nobody got. Dark Eldar ships uh, until they started releasing those Dark Eldar jet bikes, like the new – well, I say new and they're like 10, 15 years old now. They can probably um, drink by now. Mm, but like them and the Hellions. Uh, so if you see a Dark Eldar fleet, it's probably just literally those jet bikes uh, and those little hoverboards as the escorts. But like I said, not really talking about them. They're completely different. Going to start off talking about Eldar. Uh, we're also ignoring every other fleet of Xenos. Uh, Tau can, can kill themselves. They're like 30, they're 10,000 years too early to this party. Nids yeah, don't exist yet either. The wheel, let alone space travel. Uh, like Necrons. Oh, Necrons were around during the Horus Heresy. Yeah, I know. Probably like that one guy saw Akron once. <laughs> a I don't friend care. of a friend of an uncle's roommate yeah, saw right. a cron you, you, through a view screen You once. were infinitely more likely to run across an actual man of iron based civilization than a necron um, but uh, Eldar? Yeah you, you'd see Eldar quite a bit well comparatively speaking right? Uh, we know that both versions 
show up, but it is mostly craft world stuff. Uh, the Vilka Fenrica destroyed a craft world, uh, famously. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Ulthway et al. showed up uh, about some maiden worlds that Fulgrim was screwing around with uh, during the latter part of the Great Crusade. Dan uh, Gannon Fulgrim. Yeah, Evan Fulgrim, man. Uh, there are two lists uh, for Eldar. We're going to concentrate on the rules for Eldar in general more than the ships. Uh, but very broadly, there's the Corsair Eldar, which are the ones in the blue book, kind of the standard ones that you could buy from GW. And then there was the fancy Forge World Eldar, which were the Craft World fleets, which is very exciting. Uh, and either one of those is acceptable if you're fighting kind of a great crusade mission, right? Like, obviously, they're burning Craft Worlds to the ground. Uh, Eldar Corsairs could be screwing around over Maiden Worlds. They could just be trying to get some stuff from your convoy. Who knows? Eldar are tricky scum. Uh, and indeed are the trickiest of scum because their movement is the weirdest shit in Battlefleet Heresy. Well, I guess Battlefleet Gothic, right? Possibly in any game made by Games Workshop ever. That's... The man hasn't played against the Snotling Pump Wagon. He knows not from whence he speaks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're real strange because they're all sailing ships, right? You've seen, I'm sure you've seen the pictures. You can Google it, Eldar, BFG, the ships will come up. Uh, but they all seem to have these sort of wings, right? And those are super efficient solar sails. Uh, and Eldar quite literally sail through the void. Which is cool until you have to deal with it. Each Eldar ship has three different movement values. And it all depends on where exactly they're oriented compared to the sun at the start of their movement. So what will happen is the Eldar will go and before it moves, it can turn to face however it wants. So it gets a free 360 degree spin at the start of its movement, right? Uh, which is already just horrific. And then the speed depends on where the sun is. So if you've been playing a lot of like inner system games and are rolling on the blue book chart to like generate your planets, you'll know about Sunward Edge. For those of you that are just getting into it, what happens is in any game uh, set in the inner biosphere or the, the kind of the inner zones of a system, you roll a d6 and it points you towards an edge of the table that the sun is on. Uh, and if your target is kind of far away, it's harder to hit them because they're lost in, you know, the glare of the sun. Uh, but once you get right up close, they're silhouetted against it and they're easier to blow to crap. Eldar care because their orientation towards the sun like shows how cre how much energy they're getting for their solar sails and how quick they move. And they are all pretty fast. Uh, and it gets real root. So let's, let's just grab one of these at random. Uh, the Hemlock Destroyer, right? It's the little lance boat of the Eldar fleet. And its speed is listed as 15, 20, 30. And what that means is, one, when you've like decided, okay, I'm going to move this Hemlock Destroyer, you pivot it, and if it's facing towards the sun, the board edge with the sun on it, it goes 15 centimeters. If it's facing away, it goes 20 centimeters. And if it's side arc on, it goes 30 centimeters. Uh, which is pretty cool, right? I know that's what everybody's thinking. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Like the solar panels and it's getting speed and you got to kind of think about how you're moving. Uh, and man, you can really run down those Eldar if they have to sail into the sun. <laughs> if only. You thought. <laughs> uh, you thought. So they do that. They move. They have to move in a straight line. They can't turn, which again, seems great. Uh, they have no minimum movement for any of their ships, so they can just sit still or go their maximum move. That's fine. The real problem is they move twice in each of their turns. 
the second move is made in their own ordinance phase. And that's where it gets disrespectful, ladies and gentlemen. Because what will happen is a canny Eldar player uh, will set it up so that the sun is off of their port or starboard side. Uh, they will then run at you full speed, which is usually 30 centimeters for escorts and 25 for anything bigger than escorts. Fire at you. You get hit. It sucks. And then they just turn completely around and leave. Bye. And go back to where they started, which is atrocious. Uh, or, you which, know, as it bears noting, if you're thinking about it, can mean they can just hop right back out of line of sight if they hide behind, you know, gas clouds or asteroid fields or a planet. Yeah. Just jump out, shoot you, jump back. Or they can haul wholesale ass and just be 50 centimeters down the table, right? Don't play these guys in a blockade run when they're trying to run the blockade. It's not a good idea. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um. It it makes them crazy efficient. And I mean, they are super expensive. Uh, for example, that, that Hemlock class destroyer has exactly one lance, 30 centimeter range, and it's 40 points. Uh, their little frigate, which has five weapons batteries, 65 points. Uh, their cruiser with four torpedoes and a prow weapons battery, 210 points. So they're paying for what they get. Um, well, but those Lord. weapons don't. Uh, those weapons don't sound super impressive if you consider them as imperial weapons. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, we all know that the Eldar do some serious disrespectful bullshit. Unfortunately, they're not. Uh, they have the pulsar lance, uh, which the Dark Eldar have a version that does pretty much the same thing. But the Eldar have the pulsar lance. Uh, they count as lance shots, so they hit on a four, no matter your armor. However, if the shot hits, you can roll to hit again. And you can keep on rolling to hit until you either miss or have scored three hits off of your one shot. Yeah, so that little uh, that little Hemlock class destroyer with its one lance on a good day is actually packing three lances. Yeah, it's actually not quite a Gothic class cruiser. Remember that the average lance armament of any given cruiser is like two to four. Yeah, yeah, four if that's all they're packing, right? Like, it is wild. And these little sucker, mm, mm, it can be disrespectful. However, most like the the Lance Cruiser for the Eldar, which is actually also their carrier, uh, only has two, right? So that's that's not great. Like they're not throwing four lances at you, and then they get to reroll and you know cause all of these problems. But it is real rude because uh, a lot of times. In Battlefleet Heresy, if you've blown an escort squadron to shit and there's only one of them left, it's not a threat, right? Like, you can just ignore it because at best it's going to have a lance shot, you know, a weapons battery. Uh, maybe your Cobra will get off two torpedoes. And that's a little concerning, but also it's a Cobra, so not really. Yeah, just sneeze on it. Yeah, however, these Eldar suckers are kind of loaded for bear. Um, they had like the, their sword equivalent, right? Their weapons battery escort, uh, has five weapons batteries, which is pretty nasty. Mm. Uh, their Hellebore class, which is kind of the Eldar equivalent to a Thunderbolt, uh, has the Lance, has two torpedoes and a weapons battery, which is just rude. Uh, the weapons batteries themselves are real disrespectful as well. Uh, because they always count their targets as closing on the gunnery at a table. Yep. So you're like, oh, five batteries. Well, that's not so much if there's only a few of them, except it is a whole bunch. Yeah. I mean, that's the difference between, you know, hey, five on a capital ship closing is four hits. If the thing's a beam, and let's face it, most of your targets are a beam of you, right? Once the fight gets going, it would only be two shots. So the damn things are getting twice as many shots as you would expect them to. And they can move in their ordnance phase. And it, it just, it gets, it gets madness, right? Tell them about the torpedoes. 
Oh, yeah. So the torpedoes also moderately to severely disrespectful. Uh, the first thing is they have real sophisticated targeting scrambling systems, right? Uh, so turrets only hit them on a six. So right there, that's a problem, right? Um, although it does make that decision of bracing or not a lot easier uh, because who cares if your two turrets go down to one if they hit on sixes anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, when you're considering bracing against Eldar torpedoes, remember they get to re-roll the miss. Yep. Hyper effective. Yeah, it is. It is damn ungentlemanly. Uh, and then also for those of you uh, playing kind of the normal attack craft rules, their fighters, when they eliminate a target, are left on the table on a four up because they're good at this. Uh, and then for the bombers, just like the torpedoes, you need a six to hit them. And then you can reroll the die when determining how many attacks a bomber makes, which... Maximum disrespect. Yeah, because there's been a lot of times. I mean, hell, the last game Steven and I played, uh, my bombers went in. You know, I'd suppressed one of the turrets. I was still having to subtract one. But you know what? I had three bombers. So three D6... You know, minus one for each of those dice. I'm going to beat you to crap. Oh, I rolled two ones and a two. Ah, well, F my life, I guess, right? Thanks for coming out. Not a thing the Eldar have to deal with often. Uh, yes. Now, you're looking at them, too, if you're following along in the blue book, um, and you're noticing, well, it doesn't seem all that bad, because all of them have a four-up armor, and they all get critted on fours. Well, just in case you were getting a little too comfortable... With uh, with your knowledge of Eldar, Eldar don't have shields. But Steven, you say, that doesn't sound like such a bad thing. And ultimately, it's not a bad thing to shoot at a target without shields. It's a horrible thing, though, to shoot at a target with hollow fields. Yeah, hollow fields. So what this does, in essence, is it makes a whole bunch of both visually and sensor identical, like versions of the ship just around it so nobody knows what the hell they're trying to shoot at and they're just firing into ghosts uh, so against gunnery table attacks so your weapons batteries uh your bombardment cannon hollow fields cause a shift to the right you know a bad shift in addition to anything else uh, but still weapons batteries are the best way to kill eldar because against any other form of attack lances torpedoes etc including like bombers and whatnot, uh, roll to hit an Eldar ship as normal, but the Eldar player can then make hollow field saves. And on a two up, just place a blast marker in contact with the ship. No further questions. Uh, yeah. You like playing terminators? Yeah. You like having a two up save? This is your one. It's just, uh, yeah. Uh, so, however, you can hurt them with the blast markers, theoretically, because like all ships without any shields, if they roll through blast markers, uh, they will take a point of damage on a D6 roll of six. Because uh, Eldar ships are fragile. Yeah, very, it's because they're literally fragile. sung into existence and only have, you know, a 50th Dumb, of the crew. elf shipyards. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even a shipyard. It's just somebody yelling. <laughs> yelling until a, yelling until a boat appears. Hey you, hey you, you're gonna be a ship. And lo and behold, D a ship quote, was made. Held our race singer. Yeah. So what does that mean in the context of the heresy? Um, well, again, Elder didn't really show up a whole bunch in the heresy, but the crusade is lousy with them. Lousy being a relative term. Um, because the crusade is lousy with a lot of things. Um, the best you're going to hope for, really, narratively speaking, with Eldar is kind of one-off games. You're going to be playing raids. Eldar don't play battles. Um, you're going to be convoy run, um, cruiser blockade clash, run, yeah. cruiser clash, stuff like that. Um, which can make for some fun stuff, because you can always add in, you know, any number of other rules um, or ideas of your own. Armada, the Armada book, if you have a copy of it, actually has a handful of 
suddenly Eldar scenarios. Which I've never played any of them because I live a healthy fear of Eldar, um, but they're in there. And if you are uh, lucky enough to own a copy of Warpstorm, Dianya's Fighting Ships of the Gothic Sector has a treatise on uh, kind of the standard Eldar ships of the day. Mm-hmm. Now there are, um, because Battlefleet Gothic has been out of production for 10 years, uh, more ten, more than 10 years now. Mm, we're on 11. Look at that. Uh, there are, as with many things, a great bevy of community-made Eldar lists, uh, rather modifications to them, because turns out some people really don't like getting repeatedly housed by flying space elves. <laughs> uh, to which I can only respond, get good. It's not as terrible as it seems once you're used to it. Uh, although I will say, if you've only ever played, you know, against Battlefleet Heresy, Imperial Chaos, Space Marine fleets, uh, you probably are going to get rolled by Eldar your first game or two, just because they do things you don't expect, even when you, like, you can know in your head, all right, this thing can move 25 centimeters and then move 25 centimeters again in its own ordnance phase. But that's not what your heart thinks. And so you'll do something stupid and get yourself killed. That's fine. Uh, Indeed. If, if anything, that's pretty even more fine in a Great Crusade setting where, you know, they've been doing this like 200 years max. You know, they don't have endless treaties on how to fight Eldar like they do in 40k. Yeah. People who survive fighting Eldar typically takes about 10 years for their information to get back to Terra to get written down and passed on to someone else. And then, of course, it has to catch up with an expeditionary fleet, which is out of contact for three. It, it's a mess. They've got other problems, right? Nobody's going to say, oh, hey, I'm fighting. I have literally fought 40 different Xeno civilizations. I'm going to take careful notes on this one just in case they come back. Nobody's doing that in the Great Crusade. They're just saying, you know what? We are going to take a half million casualties because uh, we can afford it. <laughs> Victory. <laughs> like the Success. Uh, but yeah, like, like Steven said, there are a ton of of rules and addendums and stuff, um, which we – again, like I've, I've played against Eldar quite a bit. I've never played as Eldar, uh, so I, I don't want to comment yay or nay on anything. But one of the things that you probably will see uh, is called MMS Eldar, and that's Move, Move, Shoot Eldars. And the, the big thing is – Instead of moving in their movement phase and their ordnance phase, they just move twice in their own movement phase. Um, eh? And it's a nerf, right, to to stop them from shooting you running behind a glass gas cloud and being invincible, and it's doing that until you die. Uh, so, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, they also have a different way of hollow fields working. Uh which gives you a save in like a save against everything, but it varies because of range, whatever. Uh, it sounds like a lot of bookkeeping. It is, it is a little bit more effort I feel. Um, but again, I, I don't play Eldar. I've played against both kinds. Um, eh, is my answer. Uh, I don't really think the MMS Eldar are nerfed so much as they're more, uh, new kid friendly, right? Like if you're just starting out to play with Eldar, uh, you're probably going to lose a lot because your ships are only four up armor. And if you're not using that maneuverability, you're just going to die and get frustrated and hate your life. Um, As a this, good player should. <laughs> right? If you're not hating yourself for six months, what are you even doing? No. That's right. Um, so yeah, they're a little more user friendly, uh, more in line with the rest of the fleets. Honestly, guys, if you've got a buddy that plays Eldar and he playing a game, whatever he wants, right? Whatever one of those, at least at least for those two. I don't know what other crazy Eldar nonsense is out there. But if he's like, hey, man, I'm going to play MMS Eldar, just say, you know what, bro? You didn't cherry pick, you know, the most OP homebrew rule set to play against me. Like, it's fine. It's Plus fine. the dude probably had to spend $200 just to have a couple of cruisers, so. You're not wrong. You know, cut him some slack. Oh, poor Xenos players. Nothing in plastic for you. 
Yep, it is all that sweet, sweet metal. And God, okay. it, I've got one of those cruisers because I got it in a lot with other stuff. Um, they're pretty, but man, just metal model, kind of precarious, a little bit back heavy, and on a twenty five, a twenty eight millimeter flight stand. Yep, just, with that fiddly little base that's just going to snap right off. Yep. Like magnets, people. God, like magnets. Bless, bless all of you that have been doing that for so long. Yep. Um, now, as a quick note on Eldar, one last parting shot before we move on to um, the superior Xenos race orcs. Um, the some people among you have noted that um, Battlefleet Heresy, the Crusade lists, the Mechanicum Legions, Solar Auxilia, etc., etc., are not quote unquote balanced against uh, Eldar or any Xenos in particular. Um, and this is... I wouldn't call it intentional so much as um, we don't have an intention to fine-tune the rules that much ourselves. Um, because with Eldar, with Necrons, with Orcs, with a, basically any fleet that you want to play against ours... Um, there's probably, you know, for every official GW release, there's 15 homebrews and, um, yeah, some of which you're going to be properly. playing. Yeah. Like, you're going like to be that, playing and, what you want to play regardless. Yeah. And like, yeah. you can't account for all of it. So yeah, that, that MMS Eldar, I would say half the Eldar players I know play that list, like specifically, which totally changes how Eldar work. Right. Um, and, and we knew going in that the Battlefleet Heresy lists were only really balanceable against themselves, right? You're taking three fleets and duct taping them together. Uh, but yeah, you, you can't really balance them against the Xenos fleets, right? Because each fleet in Battlefleet Gothic has an inbuilt weakness to it, right? Uh, for the Imperials, it's a lack of long-range stuff and being a little slow. For the Chaos, it's having a low amount of ordnance uh, and, you know, just nothing but five-up armor. <laughs> For Space Marines, it's being really durable, but not really being able to dish out firepower to a huge extent. Yeah. Um, For Space Marines, it's not being good at anything. <laughs> all of which, if you combine them together and pick whatever ships you want out of that, yep, you guard it against, right? <laughs> like, Man, hey. It's almost like the Imperial Navy and Space Marines were neutered on purpose. Yeah. Huh, who thought of that? Huh. I, I wonder... Wild. And it's almost like when you stick all three of them together, they become an all-conquering force capable of driving an entire galaxy before them. Hmm. Uh, wow. I'm sure that's uh, just coincidence. Yeah. And uh, to all you Necron and Eldar players, well, you've you've been a little OP for a long time. Welcome to the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a show who's not OP and is, in fact, a great deal of ridiculous fun. Is it orcs? It is orcs, Stephen. You like that segue? I thought that was uh, solid. Here we go. Here we go, indeed. True infinity, true the cosmos, etc. Uh, to quote Admiral Sartus at Platia, a more ramshackle, inefficient, and downright ugly fleet is hard to imagine. Pat, that one's for you. Um, they are a lot of fun, though. They they make well, I was going to say they make no sense, but really they make perfect sense for orcs. Um, one, they're bad at it, right? Their leadership is terrible. Uh, they roll. So they roll for leadership on the regular, uh, the Imperial Navy leadership chart, right? Uh, and then just subtract one from it. So they have a leadership range of five to eight. Because life is hard. However, they go on all ahead full for free. Uh, but only go, and only go an extra 2d6. And yes, very specifically, uh, they go all ahead full for free because, one, they like to go fast, so they just strap a bunch of extra thrusters to the back of their ship. And all of these are wired to a single large red button on the captain's chair. Just hit the button, away we go. Which is fun. Uh, they also get plus one to boarding because, you know, they're dead hard. Um but what gets wild about them is their weapons. Their armor tends to not be great, um, well, but I mean, also it depends on which direction terrible. you're fighting from. Yeah, uh, 
they're the only fleet that has three different armor values that I can think of. Uh, and it's generally, they have a six up to the front, five up to the sides, four up to the rear. Uh, and then the escorts are six up in the front, four up everywhere else. So if you can get behind an orc fleet, it will crumble into its composite parts, which are probably like, you know, a Lehman Russ here, a Death Dread there. They just come to pieces. Uh, but from the front, they're just as well armored as an Imperial or Space Marine fleet. And from the side, their cruisers aren't, aren't terrible, right? Uh, they are really vulnerable to attack craft because attack craft, you remember, always attack the weakest facing. Uh, so if you have a, a carrier heavy list, you'll do well. However, for the weapons, the only thing that has a static value is the launch bays and what they call heavy guns. Uh, an heavy gun, for those of you wondering, are just like ordinary weapons batteries, uh, but they don't count gunnery modifiers for range. So no good shift at 15, uh, no bad shift at 30, but heavy guns, I think, are universally a 15 centimeter range. So really just no good shift. But every hit causes two hits instead of one, uh, which is just hilarious, right? Because while your standard shot is throwing a Volkswagen bus at you, uh, these guys are just firing semi, like tractor trailers full of lead. <laughs> right? Just thunk. Here's a hundred meter long, just pile of concrete. <laughs> Man. Ah, go. Yeah, um, that's great. It's fun. Uh, for their guns, their regular guns, it's all random values. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Terror Ship, which is kind of their jack-of-all-trades cruiser. Uh, one, all their cruisers are a little bit a little bit stocky, right? They all have 10 hull points, which is great. Uh, they only have one shield, which really just balances out having extra hull points, in my opinion. Uh, but their weapons batteries, so, for example, their port and starboard armament, 30-centimeter range, D6 firepower. Their prow armament, 45 centimeter range, D6 plus two firepower. So you never quite know what you're going to get uh, as an orc player trying to murder people. It's true to form, really. <laughs> yeah, it's always kind of eh. However, uh, their torpedoes are exactly the same. So let's take the Ravager attack ship, right? It's their Cobra equivalent, right? It's just torpedoes and guns, baby. Uh, it only goes 20 centimeters, is not quick. Uh, it has a guns battery of two, which is sort of rare uh, to not be random. And why is it not random? Because it fires D6 torpedoes. <laughs> each ship. Each 35-point escort... <laughs> <laughs> fires d6 torpedoes yeah i remember that a cobra fires two and it's the standard ordnance boat yeah like generally any any torpedo carrier uh in the battlefleet heresy list that's an escort is going to fire two torpedoes uh, like 99 times out of 100 cruisers the same thing light cruiser heavy cruiser medium cruiser it's going to be six if it's not six it's weird uh Ravager attack ship, which again is 35 points and, and escort and can be real nasty uh, because their squadron sizes are different and huge. Uh, so you can have just piles of them in a squadron. Uh, fires D6. Just ha ha. They also have a, a, a thing called a brute ram ship which is 25 points and goes 25 centimeters. Uh, the fun thing about the brute ram ship, cause it, it doesn't really have anything going for it is that when it rams something, it rolls four dice instead of the one you would expect of an escort. Uh, so these are great. You'll see these as like suicide ships in the orc fleet. Cause they'll just, Hey, I got, you know, <laughs> I got a giant buzzsaw on my I head. got a squadron of eight ram ships uh, and it's 200 points 
and they are just going to all ahead full into literally everything. <laughs> Until there's nothing left to all ahead full into. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, now, of course, the downside is eh, leadership, uh, which makes it hard to really put these into great effect. Um, but you can have, uh, instead of admirals, they have warlords, which you can have one per 500. Uh, so you can have a few more like rerolls and you can have a little bit better leadership and stuff like that. Um, and then there are upgrades to help with your various shenanigans. Uh, for 35 points, you can reroll the firepower dice at the guns, or you can reroll for the strength of the torpedo salvo that you fire or get extra boarding value and just all sorts of nastiness. Um, and when they're coming at you, the, the thing to remember about orcs is you want to get behind them, right? That's key. They're four up armor in the rear. Get behind them. Win the game. Uh, and don't get boarded. Even even space marines have a bad time because those warlords uh, double the, vor- the boarding value of their ships. Yes, and you'll remember from the World Leader episode that that is... Um, a separate number than the boarding modifier. Mm-hmm. Um, so really the, what the warlord nine times out of 10 equates to is a plus one, maybe a plus two to the boarding modifier. Well, but you say that even but so their cruisers have a starting hull point of 10. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Which is true. Yeah. 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 And on the note of their actual fleet composition there, um, the pirate fleet is what gets listed in the original blue book. Um, but if you have Armada or access to the 2010 Compendium, which you should be able to, I mean, oops, basically throw a rock, find someone hosting Armada on a Google Drive, mm-hmm. um, there are orc battleships, and they are gigante. Uh, they're big, huge, metal, just, you you could put them in a sock, <laughs> swing them around, and kill a man with it. Yeah, you can beat a man to death with them. It's like the Battle Barge, only... Pointy, pointier, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they have they have the the expected amount of guns, heavy guns. Maybe some of them have a lance equivalent. Uh-huh. I don't remember. No, no, they're well, not that I recall. It's it's mostly the heavy guns and the guns. Yeah, but they're big, um, like sixteen or fourteen hull point. Yeah, brutes, and they're rolling. You know, here's two d six of guns at you a piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, we're far cheaper than you would expect because everything is random, so it could all be terrible. Yeah, um, everything is random. Everything could be great, could be terrible. Who knows? Yeah, all if they you know is we're having fun. If you've ever played, and I mean, everybody knows orc players, right? They come in two varieties: normal ish. And very loud and crazy, but it's generally always a good time to play against an orc player. Uh, and their BFG fleet is in that same vein. Like you, you might get raffle stomped because all of his attack ships uh, rolled sixes for their torpedoes. So he launched a salvo of thirty torpedoes, <laughs> which is enough to even make a Gloriana go. Oh god, maybe I should brace for impact. <laughs> oh no, yeah, it's but rough. it is fun. Uh, like Stephen said, there's a couple of varieties. Um, there's the three, there's the one that's in the 2010 compendium, which is sort of, I think it's the slam blaster. Yeah. Everything in the kitchen sink. You could upgrade to the various orc clans, yada, yada, yada. Um, BFG Armada also has a version of the orc fleet list. Uh, that's the one with rocks, which rocks and the Hulk. Yeah. Rocks and the space Hulk, uh, space Hulk, as you all know, is just an amalgam of shit. And an orc has decided to live in it, and it has forty hull points and is utterly <laughs> atrocious. Yeah, I mean it's They're just ugly but fun. Like one of the things in the back of my head when we were designing the Gloriana rules uh, was what can solo a space Hulk? Yep. Uh, and the Glorianas are built to pretty much do it, but keep that in mind when you see a space Hulk on the table, right? Yeah. Like. Are, do you have a Gloriana on the table? No. Tread lightly. Tread lightly. Um, yeah. We talk about the Space Hulk more in the Black Shield episode, if you want to go back and listen to that. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, we talk about, about the it. Chaos one, but the basic stats are, are roughly equivalent. Um, in fact, more everything guns, is equivalent except more the guns. Heavy guns. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they also have rocks, which are just 
little space hulks. Uh, Tiny little babies adorable. for space hulk. Yeah. Oh. And they're easy to make, too, if you you just get a whole bunch of styrofoam laying around and yeah, random just, bits. Or um, if you go to, like, Home Depot or Lowe's or something, if you go to the garden section where you pick up, you can get these nice, uh, it's like a pumice, right? Pumice rocks of various sizes, which is what I have for my asteroids. And uh, just glue some turrets on, man. And they don't even have to be BFG turrets. Like, In case playing with metal models wasn't enough for you, now you can play with literal rocks. Yeah. And they're perfectly legal. GW came out with them. GW, <laughs> well, they didn't make models because they figured you can figure it out. Yeah. Um, out but they're a rock. They're as legitimate a ship in Battlefleet Gothic as it is possible to be. Yeah. Now, unlike Eldar, which um, in the context of the Crusade didn't really do a whole lot of quote unquote empire building, you know, by this time the empire days of the Eldar were a little bit long gone. Uh, orcs, on the other hand, um, were encountered in their teeming millions. The Wheel of Fire, Trillions, uh, the really. Ulanor campaign. Yep. Just there were definitely big, huge orc empires. And Normally, orcs play like Eldar. They just play as pirates. They do raids. They don't really participate in big battles. They do major raids if they're feeling froggy. Um, but in the context of the Crusade, you can absolutely um, bring orcs in a campaign or just in a fun one-off game as a uh, as a force fully capable of playing fleet engagement, mm-hmm. exterminatus, mm-hmm. planetary assault. Yeah, what and they are you. they are actually. Um kind of tuned for that as well, the various fleets. So if you've got the Blue Book orcs, you know, the, I think they've got like five ships in here, uh, that's perfect for like the little orc threats because orcs, as they grow in size and number and the Empire expands, they also kind of get more technically savvy. Uh, it's one of their gigs. So if you just want to have, you know, a little raiding fleet or somebody wants to play a pirate faction uh, in your campaign, uh, the basic orc list is perfect for that. I mean, that's what it was designed to do, right? Um, if you're looking for something a little bit more impressive, you know, maybe something like uh, what the Blood Angels and Alpha Legion were dealing with in the Kavas belt. Uh, the WOG fleet list is great for that. That's got your rocks. That's got some bigger ships. Uh, you know, just a bunch of different stuff running around. Uh, and then if you feel like uh, cleansing Olinor or going into the Wheel of Fire, the 2010 uh, compendium list is the kitchen sink of orc lists and just go absolutely nuts. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you're an orc player that your buddy's like, oh man, Battlefleet Heresy, yay, let's do it. And you're thinking, ah, balls, but he's got Imperials and Chaos and Space Marines in his fleet. That's the one that's going to come closest, right? Because that's the one with all the dirty tricks in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that basically wraps up for orcs and Eldar. Uh, I don't think there's really a whole lot of homebrew stuff for orcs. Most of what you're going to find is going to be either <laughs> the, in 2010 or uh, or a, one of the official books, Armada or the Blue Book. The, uh, the homebrew for orcs is the endless pages of scratch-built orc cruisers and hulks and all of that stuff. Uh, but you're right. Yes, I dive if you dare. I can't think of any rules off the top of my head. Um, certainly there are ships for them. Uh, that have been designed just because there's always new ships being designed. Oh, Naturally. one more thing we should talk about. Uh-huh. Um, just really briefly, they only have fighter bombers, which are both fighters and bombers because they're fighter bombers. <laughs> oh, wild. Um, however, they're not great, and they only roll D6 against uh, ships when they're in bomber form instead of the full D6. So mm, not that great. Um, but they are real fun because, again, you get piles of them. They do work. They also tend to give it shot assault boats as standard uh, on orc ships, which is a little a little weird. But I mean, yeah, they're orcs. Really, only expect. chaos is the only chaos is the only other faction apart from Space Marines. Um, that well, they got the Thunderhawks are a weird thing. Put um, out that many assault boats. Yeah. So, if you yeah. want to uh, play orcs, you know, get in there. Yeah. Chop, then shoot, shoot, then chop, wog. Yeah, repeat. Repeat. Repeat ad nauseum. 
<laughs> or until everything, including you, is spinning space junk. And with that, we're going to take a brief break. Uh, Jesse's going to talk to you some. And um, when we come back, we're going to talk about ship design. Hooray! This episode of Lost Transmissions, a Remembrancers Retreat Battlefleet Heresy podcast, is made possible with the support of our patrons, starting with our Legion Praetor tier, Alex Self, Chris Mack, Jacob Dillon, Garner.Tree of Woe, Drove from Music City Heresy, Luke Rizzuto, Matthew Boyce, Mr. Baldwick, Nicholas Quenga, and Sar Luther. Our Legion Centurions, Aaron Maynard, Andrew N., Angry Boy, Duncan, John Christensen, M. Tanzer, Queen Corswain, Scott LeMay, and the original Applesauce. And finally, our Legion Sergeants, Agrippina, Emily O'Hare, Garrett Lowe, Matt Bolton, Mr. Sear, Nick Gillen, The Zoy, What Do I Call Myself? Thank you all for your support. We greatly appreciate it. And if you like our show and would like to support us as well, go over to patreon.com forward slash rr30k podcast. Thanks. And we're back. Um, So due to a technical difficulty, we actually lost um, some of the content there that we planned on presenting you with today. No, fool! You weren't supposed to tell them that! No! We make no mistakes! Yeah, (laughs) they already know how the sausage is made, but rest assured... The servitor in question has been rendered down to biological components. The tech the priest Magos... in question has been reduced to a servitor. Yes. And Have his no supervising fear. Magos has been demoted. Have no fear. Jesse is fine. Yes. This is what happens um, when you leave us unsupervised. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's anybody's game. You know, who knows what's going to happen. But we do have an important PSA for you. As we have mentioned several times... Uh, a lot of the models, re all of the models for Battlefleet Gothic, are no longer in production. Uh, which means that in order to get any number of um, of ships at a good price and in numbers large enough to play with, you have to trawl the seedy underbelly of the internet. That's right. I'm talking about eBay. <laughs> Yeah. There's the Facebook Marketplace, and plenty of Battlefleet Gothic groups sell third hand. Um, or rather, used second hand? I mean, probably second third hand. hand at this point. Second yeah, hand, it's... technically, but it's been 11 years now, so. Yeah, yeah, it could. It's true. Ships, they go all sorts of places. They're just like little little plastic plague fleets, is what they are, especially in the year of the Rona. Um, sanitize your packages, kids. But. Uh, a lot of you will sometimes be looking around, and you'll notice that the going price for cruisers is one thing, and then you'll see a really good deal on, like, four or five of them. And you're like, well, I can't pass that up. So you smash that pay button, and uh, when you get your package, you start to open it up, and you start to strip off paint, and you start to realize that, gee, a lot of this stuff doesn't look like gray GW plastic. You give it a little sniff. Huh. That smells like resin. That's right. Sometimes you end up buying recasts, and you're not aware of it. Now, with Battlefleet Gothic, because the models have been out of production for so long, you know, a bit of recasting is to be expected, and ultimately you, the buyer, may be perfectly okay with playing with recasted models. But there are many among you who just gotta have that legit GW... For that collector's, uh, collector's factor. Factor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, that that is certainly how I like to live my life. Um, mm-hmm. It's nice and it's all fine and dandy to get a battleship for ten bucks, but it's really hard to argue with the good weight of a metal fifty dollar battle barge. Especially nowadays, when there are other spaceship games out there and other models out there, and just beautiful, like not recast designs. That are Mm -hmm. still very, like, robust, you know, imperial sort of things. Like those Mm -hmm. Voss pattern cruisers uh, that you can find uh, on some of the 3D printing groups, which aren't imperial. Like, they didn't just, you know, steal a CAD design from uh, Battlefleet Gothic, the computer game, and give it a go. Uh, But they're still real pretty. Uh, However, we decided that I should give a quick rundown uh, of the ships in Battlefleet Heresy about, you know, what you should expect things to be when you think you're buying legitimate DW. Uh, So first and foremost, if you are buying a battleship, it should have the weight of a small child. 
<laughs> they were all metal. Yep, without every, exception. All every battle barge, chaos, imperial battleship, they're all metal all the time, uh, except for the the batteries of the ships, which were a plastic sprue from uh, the Imperial or Chaos Cruiser pack. Uh, cruisers, the Imperial cruisers and the Chaos cruisers, are always plastic. They're always that gray GW plastic, um, which is why they're a dime a dozen, because Jesus. I, I opened up my copy of Warp Rift just to make sure I'm like hitting all the major points, uh, and it has what these ships were, Oh, no. In, like, 2002. Don't do it to them. It, <laughs> it was 15 bucks for two Imperial Cruisers. That's what uh, it was. How much is it for one Imperial Cruiser now? I mean, it's not bad. It's, like, 10 bucks for one now. Uh, or, like, 8 bucks. Like, because there was so many of them bought, uh, right. they didn't really appreciate. The battleships, though, you could get an Emperor-class battleship for 32 bucks. Mm. Yeah. Be sad. Yeah. Be sad about it. Um, but anyway... Metal. Cruisers, Imperial Chaos Cruisers, plastic. Always gray GW plastic. The um, exception to that is Grand Cruisers. Yes. I, I should say the stock cruisers uh, and the battle cruisers because those are just cruisers with Nova Cannon and lances. Mm -hmm. uh, same for the heavy cruisers. Heavy cruisers are also plastic. The Grand Cruisers are pewter. They're also, you know, put in a sock and beat somebody to death with its size and spikiness. Uh, and are generally delightful, if rarer than hen's teeth. Yes. Uh, the Dauntless Light Cruiser, again, metal. Um, in fact, everything else. All the else, light cruisers, yeah. Everything else is escorts, metal. All the ordinance. escorts, um, all the ordnance, all of it is metal. The only exception, uh, the, the Strike Cruiser, metal. Mm -hmm. uh, the only exception is if you manage to get your hands on a Grey Knight Strike Cruiser, those were resin because those were Forge World and very sexy. Yep. On the note of Forge World, though, um, ordnance. There's Dreadclaws and there's Thunderhawks are in resin, whereas Doomfires, mm -hmm. Swift Deaths, Furies, um, Starhawks. Those are all metal. Yep. And yeah, the Starhawk. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, and then, of course, the thing that. Oh, that's so sad. The Ramillies class Starfort. Also resin, designed by William Hayes, bless him. Uh, May he live forever in our hearts and minds. In the year of our Lord, 2001, $46. Uh, $7 shipping. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good luck finding mm -hmm. one of those online. Even, I think the last time I saw one online, a legit one, $600. That's wild. Don't it buy it be... for $600. I mean, you know, you do you, but Jesus I, I, I see a lot of people say that the old 1998 Metal Thunderhawk, before Forge World did it in resin, is the most expensive and rarest Warhammer model. But I think for cost-to-weight ratio, it might be the Ramillies. A hundred percent. Yeah. The Ramillies comes in four parts. Five parts if you count the Basilica that goes on top of it. Um, if somebody is selling you a whole, complete Ramillies and you can't see any construction seams on it, shit's fake. It's made of plaster, <laughs> it was 3D printed, something like that. Yeah. It's not real. If you find a Ramillies for less than $100, it's probably way too good to be true. It's probably fake as hell. It's also fake. The cheapest I've ever seen one, um, I, th I want to say, was 150 Hmm. And then I have seen one sold at like friends prices for 75, but that was in like, you know, 2011. Nobody when knew. The economy was strong. Yeah. Right. The, <laughs> the economy was strong. Battlefleet Gothic wasn't, and it was glorious. Yeah. Um, although it is really funny. So I'm looking at the Forge World section of, of this and it's got the Thunderhawks and the Eldar fighters and then the Orc fighter bombers or they just have, sorry, too small to photograph random selection of four different types. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Photography wasn't that good back then. Yeah. Um, some quick notes, some quick last parting notes on uh, avoiding recast, or rather paying the proper cost for recast, and if you want legit stuff, um, avoiding recast. All Xenos are metal. 
Well, Imperial and Chaos Cruisers, I think, were the only thing made in plastic. Xenos are metal or Forge World resin. Yes, yes. Some of them are resin, but yes. No. Tau. I think Tau and Eldar have some Forge World resin, um, but everything else is metal. Tyranids, Necrons. Yeah. Shit's metal. All all of that. Every Necron, every, every uh, Tyranid thing. Uh, half of the Tau stuff, they've got two distinct looks, like the what we would think of as like normal tau like the the big crescent half circle looking things all of those are resin um the sort of uglier kind of long ships are all metal nikasar dows all metal um well actually no don't quote me on the nikasar dows now that i think about it those could be resin um I, I only did my homework on Battlefleet. <laughs> I only <laughs> only did my homework on Battlefleet Heresy stuff. Um, Other things that are rare, um, so you might not see them and you might not be sure, planetary defenses. Yeah, planetary defenses are metal. Metal, with the uh, exception of one orbital weapons battery design, which is forward toward resin. Uh-huh. Um, all the small transports, the little escort-sized ones, those should be metal. Um any of the bigger ones, the heavy transports, those are all resin. Those are all uh, Forge World resin and mm-hmm. beautiful. I, mm-hmm. I managed to get my greedy mitts on like six of them and they make me very happy. Uh, um, yes, be jealous. Be and jealous. I am. And I am. Yeah. Uh, and then also, uh, as Stephen said, the, the standard Imperial prow, right? Now, some of the escorts, uh, the falchions, right? The falchion escorts, which are all metal have that Voss prow that never actually made it to the standard Imperial ships. Um, so if you see a cruiser with a Voss prow, uh, you shouldn't or a light cruiser with the Voss prow. You shouldn't. Um, actually there is one exception to the Voss prow design on light cruisers. Um, the endurance defiance and oh, Endeavor, that's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. all have the Voss pattern, but those are, Rare is rarer than hen's teeth, and even if you find them in metal, chances are they're still recast. Um, because you know, a lot of people think that recast is pretty much limited to resin. It's not. You can recast in metal. Uh-huh. Um, even uh-huh. if you see a battleship, big heavy metal battleship with a Voss prow, shit's recasted, baby. It's not real. Uh-huh. I mean, it's real in the sense that you can perceive it with your five senses, but it's not legit. Unless uh-huh. you consider that Voss pattern stuff looks cool. Which point it is legit, but it is not officially produced it is Games Workshop legit material. legit in the sense that it is cool for 2007. Um, I don't know, man. I'm over 30 now. I don't I don't know what the hip things are. Um, uh, Jesus Christ. Lit? I don't know. I'm not trying to figure it out. On Time is fake. Week? Oh, no. I don't think people have said that since at least 2000. <laughs> Uh, 16 was the last time I heard somebody say that one. Are we still trying to make fetch happen? (sighs) Fetch will never happen. Stop trying to make fetch happen. There, obligatory Mean Girls reference. (laughs) Sorry, I just saw saw the fleet deal and I'm sad again. Oh, no. Um, Some Space Marine escorts also appeared in Forge World Resin, but it's much more common that you're going to see them in metal because from what I understand, the Forge World... Space Marine escorts were, um, what's the official term? Hot, nasty garbage. Yeah, really. I like (laughs) most. If you see a space, if you see a Space Marine escort in resin, don't buy it, even if it is Forge World. Yeah, unless you really, really, really want to complete your collection, don't bother. Um, really, one of the biggest giveaways is just the fact that all of the resin stuff. That, Ford, that Games Workshop ever made, or Forge World ever made, for um, Battlefleet Gothic, wasn't very well made at all, and so j- probably just didn't survive this long. Yeah, the only things you should be seeing are those Grey Knight Strike Cruisers, just because of of all of their uh, like Imperial resin stuff, they were the sturdiest because you know it's a pretty compact thing. Uh, and also, people were buying them by the boatload just because they look so damn cool. Mm, they do um, look super cool. Yeah, I, I'm kind. I kind of kick myself now because I actually had one back in the day. Uh, uh, and then yeah, you, you done so, sold you it. Done goofed before uh, BFG collapsed. Oh, also, uh, the Blackstone Fortress metal. metal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Metal. Yep. Um, 
I don't know that there's even a model for every single um, planetary defense. There is. It's safe to say, if you don't have it in metal, it ain't real. Yeah, no, there is. Orbital there mines, is. those are in metal. And they're adorable. They are. <laughs> and they're honestly, so cute. Though, like, if, uh, if you wander down to your friendly local game store and they have any Battlefleet Gothic, it's going to be a pack of the mines. Yep. Um, they're like rats. <laughs> they're everywhere. They're everywhere, and because they're everywhere, they also generally get sold for the price of the original packaging, which is like eight bucks for 30 or something like that. Like, it's a good deal. Uh, and they're fun to have around. Yep, they're useful. But um, that's everything we've got for you today. Yeah, that concludes um, our PSA. Yep. Uh, stay in school, drink your milk, do drugs if they are safe. Uh, this message brought to you by Slot. Good hunting. Good hunting.